Stay tuned for another fascinating interview from another escapee from the Kingston Polygamy Group. Next on Polygamy, What Love Is This? She was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith, all of them, including plural marriage, especially plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age. But she fled. She ran away. She preferred an eternity of outer darkness to a life of polygamy. She chose hell over religious enslavement. That girl was me. After I fled, I thought I was free, but I realized I wasn't free. I was lost, alone, desolate. No home, no hope, no life. Then Jesus Christ found me and rescued me and he loved me. In his love, I found real freedom, a real home, a real life. And Jesus offers you the very same thing. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in him. He has been a refuge for me, and he can be for you too. Knowing the surpassing love of Jesus Christ today, this is why I can look back and ask, polygamy, what love is this? Welcome to our show tonight. This is uh, Polygamy, What Love Is This? And my name is Doris Hansen. I'm your host for the program. We are here every Thursday night to talk about polygamy. And tonight we're going to be talk some more about polygamy. And our guest tonight is a young lady from the Kingston Polygamy Group. She was born and raised in the Kingston Group. She got married, she got abused, and she got out. And tonight she's here to tell her story. You know, the more people that come forward to tell their stories, the more truth will come out about the coercions and the abuses of polygamy, and maybe more protection we may, able, may be able to force out of our government, whose job it is to protect its citizens in the first place, and also to uphold the law, and polygamy is against the law. So tonight we have another story, and for those who care enough about the truth, maybe it will help uh, provoke someone to do something that normally they wouldn't do about the tragedy of polygamy in this culture. So I would like to introduce and welcome our special guest tonight from the Kingston Polygamy Group, Chanel Snow. Thank you, Chanel, for coming. Thank you for having me. And for having the courage to share your story. Of course. <laughs> of course, and that is, does take courage to do that. It does. I'd also like to, to let you know that we are not broadcasting live tonight. Uh, this is a pre-recorded program, and we did that so that we would have more time to hear all of Chanel's story and, uh, and not cut some of it short. And so we won't be taking telephone calls, so don't call into the show tonight. But if you have comments or questions that you would like to ask, you can always email them to us. We'd love to hear from you. And our email address is tv at polygamy dot com and we will respond to any questions that you might want to ask so don't call the show tonight okay now let's begin with your story Chanel you were born and raised in the the Kingston polygamy group mm -hmm. so let's start from with your family um, your uh, mother was a polygamous wife which number wife was she and how many wives did your father have my mom um she was the seventh wife, and she was married to Daniel Kingston. He has 14 wives. Okay. And how many siblings do you have? Well, my mom has 12 kids, so I have 11 full siblings. And Daniel, I don't think anybody really knows how many kids he has. Every time you hear it's a different number, and everybody says, like, they counted themselves. And it's... I don't know, you're, you don't really know, but when I counted, I counted over 130. Wow, wow, mm -hmm. 130 brothers and sisters, that's quite a yeah. bit, isn't it? <laughs> and and um, we've had your sister, Colleen, on our show, and we've had her on a couple of times, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's your full sister, right? Yes. You she's have the same mother and father. Yes. 
She is my full sister. And most of the time we get people on maybe who are siblings, but they're half siblings. They have the same father, but different mothers, but you two have the same. And she has told her story of growing up in the family, the same family you grow, grew up in, but we all have our own stories. And so you've got quite an interesting story to share. What was your life like growing up in polygamy? Uh, would you say that it was a happy or a sad or abusive or a loving family that that you uh, remember your childhood as being? Well, it was definitely an abusive childhood, uh, but like most, I do have a lot of good memories. My mom and her family have always been loving. So, I mean, growing up with my mom's kids, we were, we were pretty content and happy with each other, but we were also neglected and abused. And we had a lot of really sad and depressing moments. And was, would you say those sad and depressing times were a result of the lifestyle of polygamy? Was it basically because of your father, or was it other things, do you think, that caused that? I think most of it was definitely because of polygamy. My mom couldn't be there most of the time because she had to work full time, mm -hmm. because Daniel didn't support her in any way or help raise or feed or clothe the kids at all. So my mom had to be, just, she had to be gone working full time and we just stayed home watching each other. I mean, after we got old enough that yeah. the polygamists was, were okay with the kids watching each other. Mm -hmm. And we, I mean, we were abused by our parents. So we abused each other too. Yes. So there was a lot of, a lot of pain and a lot of abuse that was going on mm -hmm. in our childhood. How did you get along with the other wives' children's? Uh, fa uh, their their families. It's kind of hard to <laughs> to say yeah. that, isn't it? The other wives, <clears throat> your half brothers and sisters in some of the other families. Did you get along with them well, or were you around them very much? Well, Daniel had a like a family. We call it a Daniel mm -hmm. family dinner once a month, and we would all go, and everybody. Well, most of the time, most of his family would be there, and we would eat, and we would play, and a lot of the kids, like a lot of us, really hated each other. We did have some friends mm. in his other families, but there was... <laughs> you, you hated your other, your half-siblings? A lot of them, was yes. Was there a reason for that? Was it because there was violence or... Oh, yes. Was... They, were, they were rude. They were very rude. They were violent. Their parents were rude to our siblings or to mm -hmm. our friends. And so it was really hard to get along with some of them because there wasn't love among us mm -hmm. yeah and and you know I, I remember that so well uh, when I became an adult and got away I I often wondered about why they could call themselves God's kingdom when there really was no love shown between anybody in my experience in the group yeah um, so you told me something about your father uh, kind of his philosophy that he said about raising children, uh, first instilling fear and the rest will come. Would you share that philosophy yes. with what he, he said? Yes, he, he told my mom that first you install fear and that fear turns to respect. With time, that respect grows to love. And that was his philosophy in raising children or just with all relationships? Um, Apparently, that's just the way he is. <laughs> oh, okay. Did your father instill fear? Did he, did he act Absolutely. that out in your life and in your family? Absolutely. Did he do it with his wives as well, or just the children? He did it with his wives, too. Um, a lot of them didn't always get treated the same way as others, so it, wasn't, it was worse for some and not as bad for others. Okay, he said, first you instill fear, and then it turns to respect, and in time that respect will turn to love. Mm -hmm. You said that he did instill the fear. Did his philosophy work? Did the fear he instilled in you turn to respect, and then did that turn to love? Oh, no. <laughs> it went backwards. Yeah. His, the fear, it, um, it turned to pain. And with pain, or with time, sorry, that pain grew to hate. Mm -hmm. 
and and uh, disrespect absolutely. absolute disrespect um, and I thought at this point I would say something in case Daniel Kingston is watching this show now or sometime in the future I just wanted him or anybody else that might have that same philosophy that installing fear which turns to respect and then love is absolutely unbiblical and is not what God teaches I want to share a verse with you it's 1st John 4 18 and that verse says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. God gave fathers um, to children to love them and to nourish them and to protect them, not to make them fear them. That is dead wrong, and it is not what people in God's kingdom should be uh, how they should be behaving. I just thought I would say that to any polygamous father who might be watching. I really loved that verse when I started studying the Bible on my own and found out that God doesn't work that way. God loves us. He doesn't instill fear in us and then expect us to respond in love to that fear. It just doesn't happen. Um, they use guilt and they use scare tactics. The parents and the other people in the group know that some of the abuse is going on. Um, they hear about it, but it seems to me like they deny that it's going on, that it's even happening behind the scenes or even if they know about it, uh, and, and they will deny it to their bitter end. I've had your sister on the show, and I've had a few other people from the Kingston group in the past few months on the show, and I get emails from anonymous Kingston uh, and they say, this isn't going on. This is the most wonderful place and the most wonderful Paul and all that other stuff. They never do anything like this. Why do they deny this is going on? Do you know? Well, honestly, I think for a lot of them, they are embarrassed. And they don't want to admit that it's actually happening because to admit that it's happening and that they're witnessing it and that even that they're a part of it is to admit that they are following a group and a man that promotes those actions. So they're afraid to admit that it's going on then? That's what they're, I think. They're afraid to face the truth. Mm -hmm. um, and I, kind of, I think you're right. I think it's true. But then there's some people that I think are, they honestly deceive themselves, making it think it's okay. Mm -hmm. my, my mother had her philosophy that uh, the the worse the things were here, the better your eternal life would be. And so she didn't care if she was abused or if she abused us. That just gave us more rewards in heaven. Did you ever hear that? I haven't heard that one, but it sounds a lot like... Sounds like the way they treat you. Yes, though, huh? a, lot, a lot like the way they live. <laughs> did, did they have regular church services and were you required to go to them? Uh, yes, they did. Every week they had uh, what they called, what everybody called Sunday school. And it was actually only two hours most of the time. The first hour, everybody was all in the same same room, and the second hour, they would split up into classes. And the children's classes, and, mm -hmm. and did they have like young adult classes? And yes. Teen and, and that. And were you required? Was it like a firm requirement that you had to go every Sunday? Did you I enjoy mean, going? For a lot of years, it kind of was. My mom would have us go, um, but we didn't hate it at first. And we did have several years where we got perfect attendance the whole year. But after a while, we got older, and the lessons just sounded stupider and stupider. <laughs> so we just started sloughing, and mm. we just stopped going, did even you, if we went to church. <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. Did you get in trouble when you got caught? At first. And there would be people that see me outside, and they'd be like, Do your, does your mom know you're out here? And I'm like, I don't know, probably. And so my mom would be like, well, you just stay inside with me so that when you slough, people don't come up and bother me about where you're at. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you had a mother that was a, a little bit more easygoing than some of the, the people that I know. Um, so did you learn about early church history? Did you learn about the Bible? Did you learn from the Book of Mormon? What were, the, what, what were their teaching resources? Well, we did learn a lot of what the LDS teaches their citizens, but um, most of what they taught us in church was about order history and about Paul and Ortel and their dads and their history and their their moms and hmm. 
That's interesting. Jesus said that, that their hearts are far from him when they teach doctrines of men. And that's what they were teaching. Huh? It wasn't mm -hmm. teaching. That's too bad. Uh, let's, let's get into abuse. Um, we always talk about abuse in polygamy groups on the show. It's very important because it's part of our life when we grow up. Abuse is a part of every person's life that I've ever talked to who came from any polygamy group, not just the Kingston, but every group has to, they face uh, abuse when the children are being raised. Virtually everyone, um, and, I, and even in talking to you, you also have gone through the same thing. I have a quote here from a person uh, who told of a, a molestation story. I don't have any names, but I want to mention it um, just to see if maybe you recognize it and for our, for our reader or our viewers to uh, see what we're talking about here. He said one of the young boys um, in the group suffered molestation from a brother, a half-brother. He would sneak in the middle of the night and molest the son of one of the other wives. It was a regular occurrence, and when it was discovered what was going on, they got the boy a wife for himself so he could take out his hormones on her instead of this other boy. Both of these boys were minors at the time, so of course we could never use their names. But this is a frequent occurrence in some polygamous families. What kind of abuse did you suffer or did you know about as a child growing up? Did you know of anything like this going on? Is anything done about it when they find out besides, well, let's just give them a wife? For the first part of my childhood, I didn't know that that was going on at all. I was one of the lucky few that was not molested as a child. Um, as I got older, I did talk to my friends and they would tell me about their stories and I would hear more about the people that they knew and that story that you just talked about. I've heard about that one several mm. times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think what broke my heart when I first heard it is the boy got to now would turn his frustrations or his abuse on the wife, the young wife they gave him. Nobody got any counseling. The, the other boy that was raped by this other boy, when he needed counseling, would he ever have gotten any counseling at all from that abuse? They don't take care of their people that way, do they? They, they tell you not to go, because if you go and if you get counseling and if you see a therapist, then that therapist is gonna tell you that polygamy is the reason that you need to get out of there, and so they don't allow you to seek counseling, and they'll, have, um, they'll appoint members within their own group to do things like that, but nobody wants to talk to them. Oh, sure not. Sure not. Uh, it's, it's so sad, and it haunts you the rest of your life. I know of several, well, I won't go into that. Um, how old were you when you first learned about polygamy, and what was the reason they told you? When they told you about polygamy, what was the reason they told you you had to live it? I was very young when I learned about polygamy. I don't know how old I was and it was, I kind of just stumbled upon it. We were at uh, one of Daniel's family dinner things and I was playing with some of the other kids and somebody mentioned that Daniel was their dad and I was like, wait a minute, he can't be your dad because he's mine. That doesn't make sense. So hmm. we kind of started talking among each other and decided, oh my gosh, he's all of our dads. Oh my goodness. And one of the other girls, one of the girls that was there, she went home and told her mom that I said that. And her mom went and told Daniel. And of course, Daniel got very upset. He yelled at my mom and said that I was not supposed to know that and I'm not supposed to be telling anybody that. And he slapped me for it. Hmm. Isn't that sad that a child can't even say uh, who their father is, can't recognize him and, and acknowledge him as a father, and he can't acknowledge you as his child. It is. For most of them, only the first wife's the kids first wife. get to. Mm -hmm. They get to do that. That's sad. And, and I, I had that problem, too, when I was uh, raised in, I, mean, we, I was part of the second family, of course, and, and we had to have our fake father's name. You mm -hmm. have a fake father, and, and we, we all do if, if, if the, the mother is a plural wife. We all have a fake name. Mm -hmm. And yet it bothered me that, that my own father, I couldn't call dad, but the other family could call him daddy, and we couldn't. Did that bother you? Is that something that... Um, 
I kind of just got used to calling him Daniel, and then after a while, what bothered me was seeing like his first wife's daughter be like, Daddy, can I have this? And he'd be like, oh, yeah, sweetheart, you can have anything you want, but everybody else got nothing. So mm -hmm. it didn't bother me until like I saw the other kids getting pretty much spoiled by him, and yeah. I was like, okay, mm -hmm. well, just because they're the first wife's kids, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that they matter more than us. That's the way they're treated, though. That's very frequently the way it's treated in polygamy. Mm -hmm. Did they tell you that God required it? Is that, or mm -hmm. did they give you a reason? They said it was a requirement of God. It was one of the laws that they said was lost by humanity, and we needed to keep it alive, and it was what was going to get us to heaven. Did you ever wonder why such an abusive way of life would be a requirement of God to get to heaven? For a long time, I didn't. I just accepted it. That's how we were taught. You accept what you're told, no questions asked. And then I started to wonder, and I would ask questions, and they would be like, well, it's supposed to teach you to overcome your, like, humanity sins, and you're supposed to overcome jealousy, and it teaches you sacrifice, and that um, I was also told when minors go and they find gold in the mines. They take the gold out and they put it in a fire. And this fire gets rid of all the other dirt and rocks that's with the gold and it comes out pure gold without everything else. And I was told that the order is like that fire. Oh. And we're going through that. <laughs> so beware so because that we're we gonna will... put you through. <laughs> oh. Yes. My goodness, that's but scary. They make it sound like they, tell us that that's, that's how it's supposed to be. It, you will suffer, but it's okay, because when you're done, when you come out, you will be pure gold. Hmm. Well, my goodness, we, we weren't taught quite like that. It's funny to compare how I was taught, you know, so many years ago, and how you're being taught. Same doctrine, but just a different way that they apply many things. Mm -hmm. It disturbed me that God would require um, polygamy to get to heaven, and I remember thinking very frequently, I don't want to go there. This is what it's like if this is what the people are like up there. Did you ever think that? I did. Um, I think everybody who leaves actually does get to that point where they're like, if you guys are all going to go to heaven, I want to go to hell because I do not want to live with you guys. Doesn't sound like heaven to me, does it? Yeah. Their, their members are required. The Kingston Group owns a lot of businesses and the members are generally required to work within their their own businesses and they never get a paycheck they get script they get their a, a monthly statement that's got how many dollars you got paid for how many hours that month and of course then they sneak some of that money out but um uh, were you required did, did you work at any of the businesses and if so what did you do and how old were you when you first started working well, I was, I was really little when my mom started taking me to work with her, and I would file, and I would do anything that basically a little kid could do. For those jobs, I didn't get paid. I just came to work with my mom, and they put me to work, and I did that with her, um, with several different jobs that she had. Hmm. Um, I officially started working on my own and getting paid when I was 13. 13? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes, they told me that if anybody comes in and asks, then say that you're 14, so that it would, they could say it was legal. And yeah. for a while, they had me mostly just on the floor and in the back room, but doing what? What kind of a business was it? You don't have to name the business, just what kind of what business it was. Well, I was working in retail, so I would mark the products that come in and stick oh. them on the shelves and rearrange the shelves. Uh -huh. But after. After I turned 14, I don't remember how many months later, they did have me run in the cash register, too. Wow. Wow. Did you like it? Did you enjoy doing that? I actually did. It was, um, it was kind of nice. It was a new experience, and for a while, most of the people I worked with were really nice to me, and they, they, I think they taught me well. And you weren't home getting abused by <laughs> babysitters. Yeah. And I didn't have to be the babysitter by then because <laughs> I had my own job. You had your own. That's good. That, that was, that's a little bit more freedom. Um, what about the, the um, Kingston Group has their own school. Um, they call it the Order School, right? Is that what they call it? Well, that's what we all call it, but they call them, they call it Ensign Learning Center. Ensign Learning Center. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you worked as a substitute teacher there for a short period of time? Three. Only for a few days, yes. How old were you? I was 15 years old. You were 15 years old, 
what what what, cra what class uh, grade class were you a substitute teacher for? First graders. You were a substitute teacher at 15 years old for first graders. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that legal? No. <laughs> do, do do they have other people as you, that young that are teachers in that school? Now I don't think that they're that young. If they are, then they already have their um, their high school diploma that they cheated their way through doing online. Um, but back when I was a substitute, it was very common. Most of my friends have, had already been a substitute a few times, and I was kind of coming in late yeah. at 15 years old to be a wow. substitute by then. Wow, this is fascinating that they, that they could run a school like that and get by with that kind of a practice and and uh, the, the, is there is is did the state ever come in and check it out or do you even know well i've been told that the state has been in there now and they recognize it as a real school but back when it first started there wasn't almost anybody that was qualified to be a teacher now they do have some people that have gone to school and they've taken classes hmm. but they're trying to get it what i heard is they're trying to get it to be like a charter school mm -hmm. so that the government will help Pay, pay for stuff like that education. too. Uh -huh. What will they do with their religious education if they do that? They're still going to do that. They're not going to allow anybody that's not in the order to go to that school. So they wouldn't stop what they're doing and they would... Hmm. That's going to be interesting to see how that happens. Uh, did you attend the school as yes. a, a student? How was it as a student to go to their school? It well, was... Well, when my mom first told us that we were going to be going, my siblings were excited, and I was like, but I like my school. I don't want to go to this school. And then we ended up going. I was only in fourth grade the first year that they actually had an official building for the school. So that's when we started going. And for a while, I was just, I didn't know how to act. And it was kind of weird to me going to school with them. And then I, mean, I saw the other kids and how they acted, and I was like, oh, all right, well, I guess I can be a brat, and I'm just going to, I guess I, I needed attention or something, so I made sure I got <laughs> suspended every single year, oh my. <laughs> sometimes more than once. So you were a bully and a brat when you went to school, or just a brat? Mostly just a brat. There were certain kids that me and my friends or me and my siblings would bully. Most of it was on the bus on our way home, and... I think it was just, I mean, that's how the Kingstons teach you and that's how the Kingstons treat you and it was just, it was just a way of life. It mm -hmm. was normal to us. That's mm -hmm. how you're supposed to act. Yeah, I think that's true. Someone within the group <clears throat> said that at death there is no inheritance rights in a family and that all money, when someone dies, all the money and assets of that person goes to the kingdom, goes to the Kingston group, kingdom, the, their, their uh, United Order main fund. But if the member is in debt when he dies, then the family has to uh, pay that debt back. If a person dies with less than $5,000 on their statement, then if their family uh, then they can't go to heaven. But if their family puts that money on their statement, then they can go to heaven. The person that dies go to heaven. Have you heard that, or do you know if it's true? Um, the last part I haven't heard, but the first part, uh, every situation is different, but there are a lot of people that have died with money, and the order has taken it. And for some of them, they've said, oh, they donated it to the order. They donated it. They're so nice. But for the ones that do have a debt, most of the time it does pass on to their children. And if they have a spouse that's alive, if it's a man's debt, then the wife does have to take on that debt. But if it's a woman's debt, the man doesn't have to take on that debt. Her children do. Hmm. I wonder why their thinking is on that. That's that's kind of strange. So, um, so but but if someone dies and they have say ten thousand dollars on their statement, is that money inherited by any of the family? If they make uh, arrangements prior to that and pretty much do it themselves, then their children will be able to have it. But if they don't, honestly, I think the order just takes it. They just get the money. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, secrecy and lying for the Lord's work is the normal mode of operation in all the polygamy groups. Every single one of them, um, and that's the way it was in the early church with Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. They lied about their polygamy all the time. They lied about several of the activities that they did. Is that Was that a problem with you when you were growing up? When, did they teach you how to lie? Did they say, don't tell the truth to this person about this subject or, or anything like that? Do, yeah. you, do you remember that? Yes, they taught you how to lie. Once um, you were old enough and you were smart enough and you weren't too blind to see what was going on, they had a good long meeting with you and most of the time more and told you that you don't ever tell anybody that you are in a polygamous group. You can say you're Christian, you can say you're Mormon, but you can't say anything about polygamy. You never tell anybody who your dad is, mm -hmm. not even your friends at school, which were in the order school because that's where we you were required to go. You even tell them who your father was, huh? We did anyway. Everybody <laughs> knows. <laughs> you know, all the polygamists knows that you're polygamists. So yeah. I don't know why you would want to keep it, or why you'd even be required to keep mm -hmm. it from them. That's, but that's it. It, just, it was born in secrecy, and, and it still is. And polygamy will always remain a certain amount. Of, even if it became legalized, there would still be a certain amount of secrecy surrounding it. I think Absolutely. that's just the nature of, of the practice. The, I know the FLDS polygamy group does not um, uh, celebrate some special days through the year. And I'm wondering if the Kingston group does. When I was in the group, they did. I don't know if they still do. So I thought I would ask you if, if the children can celebrate Christmas and Mother's Day and Father's Day and birthdays. <coughs> do they allow those kinds of celebrations in the Kingston group now? Most of the time they do. Most uh, holidays and celebrations you are allowed to celebrate. They tried to get rid of Halloween, of course, mm -hmm. several several years. And they have gotten rid of, or tried to get rid of Valentine's Day, and especially in the school. But they eventually took the girls and the boys out of the, out of the same classroom. So it was okay to give your, your friends that were girls Valentine's. But I don't know how it is now, how mm. they celebrate it in the schools now. I find it so interesting that they're so afraid of, of um, love between uh, a male and female, and yet that's what their whole their whole society is based on, on the polygamy aspect of relationships. I've talked with others from the Kingston group, and several of them have said that uh, they have marriage classes in the group. I, they never had that when I was there. Um, but evidently they do now, and some young, very young girls will be either told to go or invited to go. Did you go to the marriage classes, and how old were you if you did? Yes, I did go, but I think what uh, some of the others failed to mention is that the marriage classes were actually held in each family did their own. So there were a lot of families that didn't have marriage classes. Oh. And like Paul's kids' marriage classes and Daniel's kids' marriage marriage classes were completely different. We didn't go together. We went in our mm. own families. And I, I did start going to Daniel's kids' marriage classes when I was 12 years old. That's when they told me, you're old enough to go to these marriage classes. You need to start getting your direction. You need to know who you're going to marry. And I was plenty old, what they told me, <laughs> wow. to go at 12 years old. 12 years old. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, did, did it bother you to go? Um, did it bother you any of the things that you were hearing? Or were you too young to really fully understand what they were trying to teach you? Or did you get it? Kind of both. It, it bothered me and I didn't understand why I was required to go and why 12 years old was old enough. Because my mom didn't get married till she was 18. So I was like, why, why do I have to go to these hmm. when I'm 12 years old? And um, I was told, we were told that uh, you are to think of your God and, or sorry, think of your husband and treat your husband as if he were the highest God in heaven. And some of the kids and some of the people did ask, well, what if he, he wants you to do something you don't want to do, or he doesn't want you to do something you do want to do. And Daniel and the others that were teaching the class said, said that you need to listen to your husband. You cannot say no to your husband. Oh. It's not allowed. You are put on this earth to basically to serve him wow. and to give him kids. And so therefore, mm. if you say no to him and if you defy him, that's like defying God. Wow. Well, that isn't true. You know, I mean, the Bible does say that we need to, uh, as spouses, that, that they need to be kind and submit to one another. Uh, but when a wife submits to her husband, it's only as unto the Lord. In other words, don't do anything that God would not say is okay to do. 
that's that's very wrong. Again, they're teaching things that aren't right. So, so did you feel like, uh, and we're going to get into your marriage uh, real quickly. Um, did you feel like that you were your husband's doormat? Did you follow that advice, or um, sometimes I did. I mean, there were times that I was a spitfire, and I was like, "You're just stupid. I don't have to do this." But there were times that I really did try. That's how I was taught, mm -hmm. and. I tried to do everything he wanted me to do, mm -hmm. and it wasn't easy. No, it, it couldn't be easy. I want to talk about a story before we get into your marriage. Um, and this came from, again, from somebody within the Kingston group who knew about this woman. And she it says this girl was being forced to marry her uncle, and she didn't want to do it. And so she tried to climb out of the bathroom window before the ceremony, but they caught her and they forced her uh, to go through with the wedding. As the years went by, she convinced herself to be happy because they're told that each wife is responsible for their own happiness. The person who told this information said it was too bad her husband wasn't concerned about her happiness. She was really a neat lady. She was fun to work with. And what she had to deal with in her life was unreal. These women have to convince themselves they're happy day after day. If they didn't, they would lose their minds if they haven't already. This woman died a few years ago, still held in the bondage of this unwanted polygamous marriage. This story would have happened while you were probably pretty young. I don't know if you recognize it or not, but that isn't, that, that isn't my point. It's just a story of another broken, ruined life because of polygamy. So let's talk about your marriage. You know, you, you got into marriage while you were a member of the group. So, so tell everything that you feel comfortable talking about your marriage. Uh, first of all, how old were you when you got married? And did you choose your husband or did they choose him for you? How did that come about? Well, um, I was actually one of the few that were allowed to choose my husband without being pushed. Um, a lot of the girls, they tell their dads, yeah, I want to marry this person. Their dad says, no, you're going to marry this person. They're like, well, I don't, want to wear I don't want to marry that person. And he'll be like, then I guess you're not getting married. And a lot of the girls will stay unmarried for years until she finally says, hmm. yes, I'll marry that person. And they, they say that it's Goodness. girl's choice, but they push and push and push until you s give them the answer that they want and you marry who they want you too. But I was actually able to choose my husband. And did, your, did you and he make that choice together? Um, kind of. I, I don't know what was going through my head. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you when you married? I was 18. Okay. So I was old enough to, supposed to be old enough to think for myself. But I just, I thought I was supposed to marry him. And I was hanging out with my friends who were the same age as me and they, one of them was pregnant, one of them already had a few kids and they were like, hey Chanel, you need to get married. And I was like, well, he hasn't asked me yet. And they pushed me into sell telling them who it was and one of the girls was actually his sister-in-law. So she was excited and told her husband because her husband thought that his brother was never going to get married and that nobody would ever want to marry him. Hmm. And so then he, they, he went and told his brother and then he's like, oh, guess what? Chanel likes you. And so he just kind of started liking me back. And he later told me that he didn't choose me. <laughs> oh. But the, were, were he, they forcing him or were they kind of pushing no, him to it? No, no, he, he was, he was pushing for it as well. Hmm. And at one point during before we were engaged, uh, because we talked about it, before we were engaged, he was like wondering if Daniel was going to let him marry me. And I was like, well, if I'm not going to marry you, then I'm just going to run away. And he's like, yeah, and I'll run away with you. And I just kind of looked at him and was like, that's not what I meant, but okay. <laughs> but Daniel did eventually give him the permission. Mm -hmm. So did, did, did Daniel or Paul, the leader of the group, did they have to okay every marriage that takes place in the family? Paul has to okay everything, um, but the girl's dad and the, the boy's dad have to as well. Most of the time what happens is a boy will have a direction on a girl 
and he will go to his dad and he'll say, Dad, I've had direction on this girl. And then that, that man will say, all right, cool, let's go talk to Paul. And part of the reason they talk to Paul is because most of the time Paul knows if that girl's promised to another man. Mm, or, or if he wants her. Mm -hmm, or if one of his own sons wants her. are planning on taking her. Mm. And so if Paul okays it, then that boy can then go talk to the girl's parents. And if they okay it, he can talk to the girls. Mm. Wow. So, so they get first choice, no matter what, Paul, his sons, or Daniel and his sons, they get first choice of the girls in the group. Mm -hmm. um, and any, any of the other boys, uh, if they want one of those girls, they can't marry them. Now, you were 18. You were of that age. You didn't need anyone's permission to get married. And evidently your husband was also of age and he didn't need anyone's permission, but you had to get permission in order to marry. Yes. Within the group. Okay. Um, how were you, uh, re were you related? Well, let's go back to, first of all, to, um, to the incest part, which we'll talk about this a little, a little bit later too. But but the Kingston group does practice the incest, and they do teach some of their some of their children are taught that they will marry a brother or a sister when they grow older. Were you taught that, and how did you feel when you thought you might have to marry a brother? And was your husband related? Yes, when I was going to Daniel's um, marriage classes, you know, when I was 12 years old, yeah. <laughs> then he did tell us, everybody that was in that room, and we were all siblings, he did tell us that some of the people in this room would marry each other. And we just kind of looked around and was like, really, Ew. my half brother, that's horrible. And then there were a few that we were closer to that we felt like they were more like full brothers. And we were like, oh my gosh, I just hope it's not them because that would just be even worse. Yeah. And we would be like, we would be at the other wives' house and hanging out with the kids and they had TVs in the rooms. So we'd be watching a TV in one of the girls or the boys' room and the door would be open and the mom would come in and be like, boys aren't supposed to be in the girls' room. And we'd kind of laugh at her because we always, we always did. <laughs> and she'd be like, well, what if you guys grow up to marry each other? And we'd just like look mm. at each other and just be like, that's so gross. Oh, it kind of ruined yeah. a lot of relationships. You couldn't look at your brother or sister without thinking, do they think I like them or oh, do goodness. they like me or anything like that? Um, Marrying now, now uh, brothers and sisters don't usually get married. Sometimes they do, but the majority of the marriages are uncles and to nieces or um, cousins mm -hmm. is the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. um, I married my cousin. His dad was Daniel's half brother, so mm -hmm. we were cousins. Mm -hmm. So you were first cousins, first mm -hmm. cousins, and so that's cool. and that's illegal in Utah. Yes. To marry cousins. So what do they do? And it was your it was your first marriage, uh, so there wasn't so it was had to be a legal ceremony. How did they circumvent the law so that you could marry your cousin? Well, first they actually started by telling me you're not actually first cousins. You're not actually first cousins because you're you're half cousins. So it's more like your second cousins. So <laughs> you can get married in Utah if you want to, but I got engaged at the same time as two of Daniel's other kids that um, they, they were both underage, so they had to have parent, parental consent. And since they were both marrying their cousins, they were going to go to Colorado to get married because it's legal to marry your cousin in Colorado. So Dinah was like, hey, do you want to come, come with us to Colorado and get legally married because we're, we're going to take these girls to get legally married and you can get legally married in Utah if you want to because technically you're really only second cousins. But we can all do it at the same time. And so I was like, yeah, great. So we all went to Colorado and got married and came back to Utah with our legal marriage with birth certificate. Legal marriage. So, certificate. so you went there with two other couples. Is that what they normally do when they marry the cousins off, go off to Colorado to, to perform the ceremonies? To Colorado, yes. Or um, a lot of them, if it's not the first marriage, they just don't get married. And yeah. some of them, even if it is the first marriage, especially if it's like, one of Paul's kids mm -hmm. or one of Daniel's kids. A lot of them, the first marriages, they don't legalize. That way that man or that boy can get another wife and the state can't come in and say, you, you, you're a polygamist. They can just be like, I'm not married to anybody. I'm just a slut. But a lot of the times 
Wow. The cousins, they take them out of state to get married where it is legal. When they go out of state like that, um, and the question, there's, there's a question obviously that is asked about your relationship, how close of a blood relationship you are. They, and they can say, well, the, we are only first cousins. But they fail to ask, the, the questionnaire fails to ask, or they fail to say, but my mother and father were brother and sister, <laughs> or aunt and, or uncle and niece, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So actually, they are closer <clears throat> than first cousin because of their parents were also involved in the, uh, the, the blood marriage. Well, when I went, um, they just had us fill out a piece of paper, and it does ask on that piece of paper if you're related and how. And so I was like, well, how should I answer this? And they told me, just say that you're not. So I said that I wasn't on the paperwork. Hmm. Oh, so again, there, there they are, t um, falsifying legal documents. Interesting. Tell us about your marriage. What was it like? How did your husband treat you? Well, at first he he was kind of decent. <laughs> he did tell me a lot while we were while we were engaged and after we got married. A lot of the things that his dad was telling him that my family was not a good family, that we were bad people. And so he soon after we got married started telling me that I was a piece of crap and that my family was crap and that I did not deserve him and he would call my mom and my siblings swear words and just really put me and my family down and make sure that I knew that he was the one above and that he was the one who deserved better and that wow. I was supposed to feel lucky and I was supposed to feel blessed to have him. To have him as her husband. Mm -hmm. That um, the physical or the verbal abuse and emotional and mental abuse, it definitely escalated and he became physically abusive. First, it started out with him trying to rape me and I fought to keep my clothes on for a long time and for a while I was successful and he would stop and then he had the nerve to tell me that right after he would give up and he would stop. He had the nerve to tell me, if anybody else ever tries to do that to you, I want you to fight them as hard as you, as hard as you fought me. <laughs> but of course, throughout our marriage, he fought even harder and he ended up being successful and I was so, so broken, I just stopped fighting. Hmm. My goodness. How long were you married? Before he actually successfully raped me or before he tried? T total time that you got married, that you were married and that you left him? How long was your marriage? Just under two years. Under two years. Mm -hmm. So this abuse started right after you got married? How, how long Pretty after? Pretty much. It started two months, within two months. After you got married. Mm -hmm. And it lasted for almost two years then. Mm -hmm. Was he physically abusive as well? Yes. He, he started out just by using his strength and grabbing my arms and he would throw me against the walls and to the floor and he's, <laughs> he's thrown me down the stairs and at one point he had heard that Daniel choked one of his wives and so he made this plan that he was going to, he was going to choke me oh because he goodness. was upset at me. So he, he ended up leaving the house and he was gone for a few hours and my sister was visiting me and that's what upset him because we were talking about one of the other men in the order and that basically he was a crappy man and my ex, he did not like that because he was a man in the order and you were taught that the husbands and the men are these gods and mm -hmm. so he, he was upset and he planned to to choke me, but he left the house and he calmed down, he came back and he was nice and then just not very long later, the smallest thing ticked him off. Mm. Something ticked him off and he started choking me. Was your sister still there or had she left? She was still there, but we were in the bedroom by then. He, I don't remember how we ended up in there, but we were in there and he started choking me. He stopped and I just started yelling at him and I was like, don't you ever do that to me again, that is not okay. 
and he was like, shut up or I'm going to do it again. Mm -hmm. And of course I didn't shut up because I'm not okay with that. And I needed him you. to know that. Good for you. So he choked me again this time until I passed out. Oh my. Mm -hmm. Did he, what did he do when you passed out? Did he worry or wonder if he'd hurt you beyond repair or did he just walk out? What happened? Well, he stopped and I, was, I wasn't out for very long. So not, it was within seconds after he stopped that I, I came to. And I just kind of started freaking out and crying like I couldn't believe this just happened. And then he started freaking out and he was like, I can't believe I did that and I'm gonna go, I know I have a friend, he has some drugs and I'm gonna go overdose and I'm gonna go kill myself because I just did that to you. But that wasn't the first time he was abusive, but mm -hmm. that was, I think it was a shock to him as well except I don't yeah. know why, because he did tell me later on that he, he was planning on doing that. Wow, wow. Ooh. How much longer did you stay with him after that? It was, let's see. Ten months. Ten months, and then you left him. Mm -hmm. What was the, the, the impetus to get you out of there? What made you leave, finally, and say, I've had enough? Well, I got to the point where I, I was numb. I was trying to live my life like I saw a lot of the other moms and a lot of the other wives in the order do. Like, if you see them, a lot of them look like zombies, or yeah. they look like robots, and I yeah. was trying to do that. And at one point, I had begged somebody in the group that was 21, begged him with tears in my eyes, practically on my knees, I was on the stairs, begged him to buy me some alcohol because I hated my life so bad, I did not want to live it sober anymore. Mm. And wow. I couldn't stand it. And so I just, I mean, I got to the point that I just, I couldn't live that life anymore. I couldn't do it and I could mm. either commit suicide or I could leave. And you just chose to leave. I'm glad that's what you chose. There are some who do choose suicide. I know I've worked with some of them in the Kingston group. I actually had attempted suicide a couple of times. Did and you? I While you were married? Yes. And I was cutting my wrists regularly. Oh, you were? Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. Um, I, I, I'm going to ask you this. You, when you left, you quit doing that. I yes. presume that you got better. <laughs> yes, I. <laughs> you cut out of the situation. And I got left out of that. I, I actually, I held my exacto knife. I kept it in my purse and I kept it close in case I ever had that desire to do it again. And was that just but to I stop didn't. your pain? Is that was it was it to make new pain so you couldn't feel the other pain? Is that it was why you to did distract that? me. The wow. pain distracted me and. This may sound kind of creepy, but watching the blood flow was a distraction as well. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely to keep my mind off of the other pain. Mm -hmm. My goodness. And how many women, girls, do you believe are in polygamy groups today, whether it's a Kingston or any other group that's going through the same thing that you've gone through and they're, they're still living through it? I think most of them. I think most of them are, if Good. not the physical, at least the verbal and the mental and the emotional, mm -hmm. which actually is harder to handle. It is. It's very difficult to handle. There's d deep, deep scars mm -hmm. left after that. Uh, well, I'm glad that that you had the courage to get away from um, from your husband. Do you regret leaving him? No. Do you regret leaving and walking away from the Kingston group? Not at all. Is there anything that you have discovered after you left the group uh, that surprised you um, that you didn't expect to experience or see on in the outside world. In other words, they on the inside they say, don't go out, everybody out there is wicked, everybody out there is horrible, uh, mm -hmm. you won't find anybody who will love you out there, they're all evil. Did Was there anything when you did leave that you discovered, wait a minute, that isn't true? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> the first thing, the very first thing I noticed and experienced that was a total shock to me is like everybody else who says it all the time, but it, it is the love. I left and I experienced love. I watched it among neighbors, complete strangers, except that they lived in the same neighborhood. And 
especially with the family. Um, but I experienced like what it was like for someone to just to help somebody, just to help them. Just acceptance for who you are, mm -hmm. just, just because you're you and they accept you mm -hmm. without the judgmental um, negative kind of thing that you get inside the group. Yes. After you d got divorced, you became pregnant and they knew the baby wasn't his, but what did they do when they found out you were going to have a little girl? Well, <laughs> well, first of all, even before I got pregnant, I was being harassed by my, um, my ex-father-in-law and a lot of the other ones in the group and they kept trying to tell me that I needed to go back to my ex and I needed to talk to Daniel and go through the chain of command <laughs> and they would work things out and my marriage would be different and we needed to go back and I just Three. for a long time would say I'm so done with that crap and after a while, I would just start ignoring them and they would leave me alone. Mm -hmm. But by the time they all found out I was pregnant, I was far, far enough along that I already knew that I was having a girl. So within a few days of it getting out, I had somebody texting me and asking if it was my exes and I was like, no. And she's like, well, my friend said that his sister said that it was. And not very long later, his his dad continued to text me and call me and call my mom and tell some of my other family members to have me call him and I was like what does he want mm -hmm. so I finally texted him back I wouldn't call him back but I texted him back and asked him what do you want to talk about and he's like well I want to talk about your future and what plans do you have for your future and I was like why do you care and he's all, well, I know you're supposed to be in the order, and I hope that you would come back. And I was like, and I, I told him that I was done with the drama, and I was done with the abuse, and I was finally safe and finally free, and why would I come back, and where, w where in the order would anybody treat me right except my immediate family, because his family made sure that the whole order was believing things about me that were not true. And then I asked him, do you think I would actually go back to your son? Because there's no way in heck that, ha that would happen. He told me he would hope I would, and he asked if I could forgive him, and I just told him that I'm not going to give him any more chances at ever being in my life, so to give it up. And he finally left me alone. Okay, that's good. That's good. Uh, okay. Chanel, we are at the end of the show. We're at the end of our time. Uh, as usual, we don't have enough time to talk about everything that we'd like, but I think we got a good part of your story in, and I'm glad, and I'm grateful that you felt comfortable to share it. And um, any time that you want to talk more, you know, we can make more time for you to come and, and finish the show. And I would like to thank our viewers for watching tonight. We have seen another uh, very profound interview from someone from the Kingston Polygamy Group and how dramatic it is for them to live in it and then to get out of it. Um, I'd like to say in closing that uh, for those people who think they're doing God's will by living polygamy, uh, they think they, they can become gods by living it, but the truth is that it was uh, instead of polygamists becoming God, it was God who became a man, the man Jesus Christ. He lived a holy and sinless life. He did all righteousness. He did nothing or said nothing wrong, and he allowed people to beat up on him, call him names, whip his body to shreds. Don't live polygamy for salvation. Jesus already did it for you. Good night.